fantastic Wednesday lesson of the day. Nothing to do with this, but uh, I just thought this is a funny thing that Dr. Cohen got as a gift. I never get gifts like this because I don't deal with that. Um, I thought it was a candle of me, but it's apparently not. So today, lesson of the day, three of my first consults in a row were asking about forehead lowering, forehead lowering, forehead plasty, um, different names for it. And I just wanted to go over that, what it means and what it has to do with brow lifting versus the hairline. So forehead lowering procedures are meant to lower the hairline, or it's called hairline lowering also, to make this size here look a little bit shorter so you don't have as much scalp going up. And uh, I personally, as an aesthetic, I like taller foreheads. So like my girlfriend has a taller forehead, her mom's got a taller forehead. I like taller foreheads. I think they're, they're nice. So when do I choose to do it and what are the options is what I want to go through. The patients, if you look at them from the side, if you look at the forehead, it kind of comes up, 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 and then it starts to curve. If it curves back a little bit and has hair somewhere there, it's fantastic. I think that's great. If it curves and starts to become flat on the top, and then you look kind of like RoboCop, the original RoboCop with Murphy, uh, that's the look where they kind of shape his head. But either way, his helmet starts back here and you can see it kind of goes up and then gets flat. That's when I think a forehead lowering is appropriate. And what you do is you try to bring the hairline forward. This is very different than hair transplantation. It's very different than pigmentation. It's different than all that kind of stuff. What it is, is a procedure where by we actually make an incision across the hairline, remove the skin in front of it, release the scalp all the way back, bring it forward and attach it down. So that's what it's used for. It cannot be done on patients with a receding hairline because you'd move that forward and then it would just, you'd end up losing hair behind it again and move back and you end up having a scar coming all the way across. For it's somebody, it's, it's for somebody with a stable hairline, uh, mainly performed on women, I would say 90 plus percent of the time because women don't really lose uh, so much hair over time. So uh, this is mainly a female procedure and it's done to lower uh, a hairline on a tall forehead and it can come all the way over to here or it can go all the way down to there just depending on the hairline and how it's designed. I don't like to do it on people who have just a little bit of a tall forehead because it's a big cut that goes all the way to the scalp and it's a big surgery. So it's really for people who need a, a bigger kind of change. How much of a change can you get in a single stage where uh, you just do the surgery and go release the scalp and move it forward. You can get anywhere from two to four centimeters fairly easily. Um, so over an inch fairly easily. If you wanted more than that, now you're talking about doing galeotomies, meaning you have to actually score uh, the aponeurosis that's under the fascia, uh, uh, under the scalp and you might get some hair loss uh, or you have to do expansion. And you can do intraoperative expansion where you put tissue expanders in there and stretch the scalp, or you can do pre-op expansion. So I don't think those are necessary. Most people do not need that much and they only need really around like two and a half, three centimeters. So most people are a single stage. How is this performed? We go to the operating room, you go under twilight anesthesia and the incision comes all the way across. Now there's two ways to do the incision properly. One of them is a sinusoidal pattern which means you go in a wavy pattern all the way across. And the other one is to do zigzags, zigzag um, type of incision. And it can be straight, it can be beveled, it can be trichophytic, pre-trichophytic, uh, million different ways to do it. The way that I like to do it is in zigzags. So we come around the hairline in tiny little zigzags as it naturally occurs. I have hair transplants, but we, not, we, we do that in staggered fashion in order to keep it looking natural. So I like doing zigzags. Uh, some people do sinusoidal. I find the zigzags heal better. And uh, we bevel them so the hair follicles grow back through the incision. And then back here, as you come across, you bevel them so you don't cut any hair follicles. So this is beveled that way, that's beveled that way. And we remove, we release all the way back to the occiput, move the scalp forward, have marked where we want the forehead to end up, cut away the excess skin and pexy it down. And the way that it's pexied or attached is either with 
uh, cortical bone tunnels, which means you put little drill holes into the scalp and, and into the calvarium and put stitches through it, or you do MyTech anchors or something like that. Um, it doesn't really work so well when people try to attach to galia to move it forward and do a super uh, galial advancement. So um, I don't personally like MyTech anchors, but they do work well for this. Uh, I just use drill holes. So I put a couple drill holes, one, two, three, four, uh, all the way across, and I can lower the scalp that way. And then I suture everything closed with some deep suturing, but you don't want to put too much because it makes you lose hair. So uh, that's how you do that part. Now, let's say you want to do a brow lift at the same time. It's a little bit of a struggle because the two things are going in opposite directions. One's coming down, one's going up, and they meet in the middle. So if you want to do a brow lift, you can, but I tell patients, I don't promise you it's going to be the most amazing brow lift ever because it comes down a little bit. So you'll get a little bit of a brow lift out of it. It's really hard to get the two to adjust. But what I do is I use those cortical bone tunnels. I release this side of the brow all the way down like if I were doing an endoscopic, or you could do a subcutaneous, you could do it either way. And then I attach it back to the same exact holes. So what happens is the incisions are now kissing because these are spanned to the same suture holes as this was, and now the incisions kiss and it doesn't scar. So the healing time itself, usually uh, you have a headache for a couple days, at about a week to eight days, all the stitches are out. And then at about three weeks, people don't really notice you did it, but it's a little red on the incision. You could put makeup. Uh, it takes probably six months for the hair to really start growing through it. And it'll keep growing through it for uh, over even two years. You'll see little changes as it comes across. The chance that you need modulation of the scar is pretty low. Very rarely would people become hypertrophic. And sometimes people do need hair transplantation where you just grab a follicular unit extraction device and take a couple of hairs from back here and pop it along the hair, hairline. It's also useful to uh, use to feather around because when you do these procedures, you lose the fine baby hairs and some people want to really kind of, uh, it's a soft appearance. And you could try to grab some nape hairs and soften it over time. So that's the hairline. Uh, lowering procedure or forehead plasty. It takes itself uh, usually about an hour or so. The other ways to advance the hairline are with hair transplantation uh, for the most part and the hair transplants that you do on the front of the hairline. There's two types. There's FUE and FUT. FUE is follicular unit extraction and then FUE is the follicular unit transplantation which means you're actually cutting a strip. The strip technique Great technique, but it gets thicker hairs, coarser hairs, and you don't want those in the front hairline. So the extraction technique is better. What we do, the extraction technique is come along the posterior scalp, lateral scalp, and we find the finer hairs, pluck them out, and then pop them in one by one. And this is done over the course of uh, anywhere from four to eight hours, depending on how many you're doing. So um, that's a nice way to do it for men or to touch up uh, a hairline lowering procedure that you've done for women. Pigmentation is generally not great in those areas in the front. It's nice to fill in if you do micropigmentation. And over here is not great for grafting. So uh, you always have to look at the hairline over here and you see that the scalp is really thin, does not have a thick dermis. It's not good to take thick follicles and put them in thin skin. So there's a mismatch in the hair follicle to dermis size and it doesn't look, it looks like pubic hairs are coming out of here. So you have to be very cautious uh, doing that because nobody wants pubes on the side of their head. Um, the other thing to look for when you're doing for uh, hairline lowering procedures as far as the before and afters go is you want to make sure it comes all the way down and makes a nice smooth transition to the temple. A lot of doctors when they do it they go here and they go straight up and they don't advance this side part so it just looks like the hair goes up here and then comes up forward like that and it's a little strange and this is really uh, part of the art of designing hairlines is trying to make a smooth transition three-dimensionally from this side, from the corner, and from that side. So even if we were to do a hair transplant, and let's say I see myself, I have these hairs are lost, but let's say I had hair here um, like I did a couple years ago, you don't start the hair transplant here and come across. What you do is you assume this will be lost like it's lost in me, and you draw a straight line up from the sideburn, and you follow that back and around. Like that, you come to the apex, back around, and the same thing. That way, three-dimensionally, you're always good, even if you lose it over time. And I'd say that's it. I did have other issues come up today repeatedly about actual uh, fat loss in the face where people thought it was fat loss, and I explained to them, you know, if the whole world is a 
if you're a hammer, the whole world looks like a nail kind of thing. Um, if we know about the word fat and collagen, we think everything is fat and collagen. And realistically, in the face, there's multiple tissue layers that get deflated over time, which means you can't fix everything with fat injection or filler, multifactorial. So uh, we'll save that for another time because I got to head downstairs and back up to see a patient in an hour. Hope everyone has a happy Wednesday and thanks for joining.